Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm Neon Felicity. Um, I am a rave philosopher. I'm a utopian philosopher, but in, in the large sense, but in the uh, immediate sense, of, I consider I mainly think of myself as a rave philosopher because I think of uh, rave culture as the source of most of my wisdom, even though I have a degree in philosophy. Wait, did I just? Um, so, uh, anyways, I wanted to start with uh, reading these lyrics to uh, one of my favorite songs. It's called "Religion Evolves," and uh, hopefully, I can hopefully I can uh, impress upon you that you need to listen to the whole album that this is from, um, just with these lyrics. But I decided to read them instead of play the song, um, so that you can uh, not miss anybody and miss any uh, lyrics from the dope beat that it's over. But. <laughs> I spent my whole life perplexed by religiousness, front doorstep debating with Jehovah's Witnesses. I was a teenaged empirical thinker, a spiritual seeker, obsessed with rap. I considered it lyrical research. This was the medium that I could think and speak in, flipping ridiculous figures of speech over beats like every weekend. My CD collection became my personal gospel. I was an apostle, like Thomas, wondering if was it impossible to rock shows and still be thoughtful? So paradoxical, speaking in tongues all over the drums like Pentecostals. I figured if I could master the craft, I could start a new religion, devoid of superstition, a descendant of secular humanism, with the ecstatic rituals of ancient mystical shamanistical visions, except based on philosophical naturalism, which no means, wait a sec, which means no ca counterfactual claims, no supernatural, nothing but region, reason and evidence, troops salute the rational. In my religion, the truth is sacred, and science adjudicates it, and meditation is cool if you want to find your Buddha nature, but human, human nature exists too, and it's not rude to face it. Enlightenment comes when we understand how evolution shapes it. I'll turn my religion upon itself like an, like an Ouroboros. He pronounces it like that to make the rhyme work. But, um, uh, religion evolves, it adapts, ask a biologist, a cognitive psychologist, a sociologist, an anthropologist, a behavioral ecologist. Religion is all of this. Two or three new religions get founded a day. They're just like rap artists. Most of them won't be around in a decade. They all compete for space and followers and human devotion. Religion evolves because many are called, but few are chosen. Approximately 10,000 religions are currently active. So forgive me if I don't ask which exact version you practice. Chances are a flip of a coin is probably Abrahamic. Half of the planet is either Christian or Jewish or Islamic. We, we can, again, he pronounces it like that to make the rhyme work. Um, we can track the demographics, study the epidemiology, but human beings have been religious since before the Holocene. 12,000 years ago, agricultural revolution. Prior to that, most of our significant evolution, small-scale societies surviving in the Pleistocene, had a strong incentive to unite like a hive of bees. Religion is a device for binding people tribally, and if you're in my tribe, then, well, then I'll die for you, and you'll die for me. Religion is an evolved mental technology, definitely, but did it evolve culturally, or did it evolve genetically? Or is it a byproduct of several other mental capacities that evolved independently and separately function adaptively, like agency detection systems triggered hyperactively, or theory of mind, which means reading people tactically, like, I know what you're thinking, who the hell is Baba Brinkman? Is he some kind of cross between a prof and juvenile delinquent? Yeah, that's right, that's what I am. Now let's get back to the question at hand. I have a conscious mind and I'll try to predict your thoughts as best I can, and I predict you've never considered wh what religion is adapted for, or if you have, then I predict you've never heard it wrapped before. So how do I know it's adaptive? It could be random drift. It could be a byproduct of something else that has a adaptiveness, like your belly button, which is amazing, but it's really not for navel gazing. Nah, it's a side effect of your umbilical cord. So religion might be a viral meme that's parasitic, or it might be an adaptation that maximizes descendants. It might benefit individuals, or it might benefit whole groups. Or it might be the invention of cynical priests trying to control you. Or it might be a belly button byproduct, or adaptive in the past, or maladaptive in the present. These are good questions to ask. And science can find the answers, and the answers are non-obvious, except for the answer to where religion doesn't come from, divine providence. So I really love that song because it, 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 I, I really love doing an evolutionary um, analysis of the phenomenology of religion because I feel like it's a counterintuitive practice um, because, you know, but I think that's, and that's why, that's why um, fundamentalist religious people are very, that, that why they deny evolution and they're very aggressive in shutting down the talk of evolution and they, they want to say anything, they want to argue that, you know, 
anything but a naturalistic explanation of the, where, where we come from is um, accurate or possible because then that naturalistic explanation, Bob Brinkman, the guy who wrote that song, is, the song's called uh, Religion Evolves. It's from an amazing album called The Rap Guide to uh, uh, Religion. Um, and there's another song on there um, called Darwin's Acid where he talks about how the theory of evolution is like acid being poured on superstitious beliefs that have existed for thousands of years. And it, we can break, it's the, it's the, that's why it's the greatest theory that science has ever produced, but the greatest idea that humanity has ever pr produced. And it can, it can help us understand everything, including the thing that, the, 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 the social institution of religion that has been operating from a, um, from a uh, dogmatic, um, uh, stale, and I would argue de obsolete and dead um, uh, shell of its former self, where in the early stages of pre-civilizational human existence, you know, we, we developed this, you know, we, we developed spirituality and the religious impulse like tens of thousands of years before we developed civilization. And so that's kind of how we, like he was saying, we had a, our ancestors in the Pleistocene had a strong incentive to to unite like a like a hive of bees. Like we're our social nature is the primary uh, advantage that we have in the Darwinian struggle, on, you know, on, on Earth. And it's how we've managed to become, and we've managed to succeed at it so much that we became the dominant species on Earth, you know, to the degree that we're now, you know dominating the rest of the earth to such a degree that we're extincting a lot of it on an increasingly rapid basis. And so, and that's why, and I, I skipped the chorus, which um, I kind of almost wish I hadn't, um, but there's, uh, uh, here, let me just read the chorus, let me just read the chorus real quick. Just, I skipped it because it's like a little bit more rhythmic and it's like a bit less of a you know, poem, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's a demon-haunted world, you can take it from Carl Sagan, whether Christian or pagan, religion evolves. Whether it benefits one of us or whether it benefits all, adaptive problems are going to get solved. Religion evolves. The bigger the scale of a society, the bigger the gods. People get along when someone's watching them. Religion evolves. We'll send a rocket on a manned mission to Mars. If the holy wars don't kill us first, let's hope religion evolves. And so that, like, that holy wars thing um, is very, very relevant to this whole uh, rave religion concept because I um, very strongly believe that the drug war is a holy war. It is the fascist fundamentalist Christians who still and oligarchic billionaires who have this alliance between the, the, there's a um, capitalistic Christian theocratic um, fascist government that is uh, that we're all being um, uh, ruled by um, and you know, for the past couple thousand years in various forms, um, the capitalism part being a newer innovation in the past 500. Um, but, and I'll get to that in a minute, but, um, so anyways, um, I wanted to, so a lot of people um, who were raised uh, in religious households, um, they get to a point where they, uh, you know, they, be, they they learn enough about what Christianity or whatever fundamentalist, old school, traditionalist religion has been doing, and then they're like, oh, I don't want any part of that. But the the um, the spiritual impulse is so deeply embedded in human psychology that m most people can't um, shake it. And even even people who think that they have, I, I'm 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 quite convinced that um, the majority of the people are still have. At least in this society, Christian programming, whatever, whatever the dominant traditionalist religion of any society, I think people, even if you know they uh, are very progressive thinkers, you know, it's, it's still in deeply in there, and it's it's very hard to uh, uproot those because they're like the building blocks of our consciousness that, that we learn in the earliest ages, and that's why you know that's why a lot of atheists talk about taking children to church as child abuse because they don't consent to being programmed with the indoctrination that they're being fed on a daily basis for reading the reading these, you know, uh, scriptures over and over again that, like, you know, the, even their parents don't understand the context in which this shit was written that, we, or in whether or not it's relevant or appropriate or ethical by any, you know, reasonable standards. Yeah. Yeah, I was told to take deep breaths. Um, thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you. So, 
the um so the thing about so so in that context um they they've, they've done a lot of surveys like a lot of fish, official polling outlets have done a lot of surveys tracking uh, religiosity um in society and so they ask questions like do you consider yourself religious or do you consider yourself spiritual and the the fastest growing identification among these uh, dimensions is spiritual but not religious it's like you know, it's like a quarter of the population at this point that's like they, 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 there's an acronym for it SBNR so it means spiritual but not religious and a lot of people um, self-identify with that and I, I think it's because you know it's there's a lack of um, uh, official cultural institutional um, legitimization of the spiritual impulse that's like th that's the good part of spirituality that's like that's the pro-social part where we are, can tap into the transcendent nature of reality because where we we're not individual you know our individuals uh, ego our individual self is an illusion I mean we have this body that is that's individuated in some ways but where it's so in incredibly inter interdependent with the physical world that we're living in that it's like that it's a uh, it's a distinction without a difference, and it's more of an illusion than uh, than anything else. So people, people talk about um, psychology as the you know, well, I've heard it, the, the the phrase um, um, a subject without an object to both to describe psychology and theology. So it's, both are relevant to this because um, the spiritual impulse is like the the and the spiritual experience is when we you know lose ourselves in the uh, true reality of the the broader. Um, uh, um, enmeshment that we exist in ontologically with the rest of the world. So, but I believe that there are aspects of religion. I have come to this um, very begrudgingly, honestly, um, because I, you know, uh, I. So the reason I got a degree in philosophy was because I um, went to a Catholic high school and took a theology. We had to take theology classes. And we would go back and forth from between biology and theology, you know, like adjacent to each other. And so I would, and I, I learned, I started to notice the difference between the academic rigor and the study of God versus the study of <laughs> bio, biology. And and, I, and so I then, so then I realized that it was all a bunch of lies to control us. And so I was, I became kind of an aggressive anti-theist, which I, you know, s still am. But I, I, the reason I got a degree, I, I wanted to study philosophy in college is because I wanted to study um, all of the various other ways of interpreting the big picture of reality outside of the Christian faith. And so, um, and so the idea of religion has, all, has for most of my life, um, primarily meant um, just a mechanism for deceiving people into, wait, did my computer, wait, what is going on? A mechanism for um, you know making people fall in line and not question their authorities. Um, so, but there's a there's this there's a great talk um, from a psychedelic science conference from uh, 2013. It's called "From the Johns Hopkins Psilocybin Findings to the Reconstruction of Religion." And in that talk, that was a, that was a mind blowing, life changing talk. I, I saw it like almost a decade ago, where he argues that the reason that religious institutions and the phenomenon of religion and in, in civilization is, uh, is the way that it is is because the so there's a loop um, between like the three constituent parts of religion are like the mystical experience and then a doctrine and then a ritual and so and for like living religious traditions like a lot of indigenous traditions that where they ha haven't or you know, where they've maintained their their psychedelic mysticism and they and they haven't suc succumbed to Either Christian or capitalist colonization and um, you know uh, sanitization um, and regimentation um, and you know getting buzz cuts and chopping off their long hairs and whatever like the military you know signing for the military uh, that's sorry that's sorry that's sorry point anyway. <laughs> but uh, um, so but so he was saying how so I don't know if you got, I hope everyone is familiar with the Johns Hopkins psilocybin findings because the, they, were, they were they they kick started this the psychedelic the renaissance in psychedelic research in, in 2006 because they found that the vast majority of the participants in these trials with psilocybin had were reporting that it was either the single most significant in, <laughs> experience of their entire life or among the top few and and so it's like, oh, gee whiz, we got a of an important phenomenon here. And so they kind of like started to lead some of the regulatory apparatus, apparatus to uh, 
a, a, to start green lighting other other universities to start studying these things and 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 uh, those studies were like they were not on sick patients they were they call they call them healthy normals they they did they gave psilocybin to people who you know don't have any you know diagnosed problems and they, they, it produced this you know uh, what they what all the participants characterized as a spiritual awakening and so so he was top pointing so this in this talk he was talking about how there's a potential for the us to salvage the healthy parts of um, what religion provides for humanity um, without it without it necessarily ossifying into a, an authoritarian fascist dogmatic you know tyranny as most of the religions that we're familiar with have and so this concept of rave religion um, kind of came to me when I was like thinking about you know like this um, I don't know I like I I've always been I've been a raver since uh, since I was 18 and but I but after COVID I really like I and I started when things started opening back up and started being able to go to parties again like it really reminded me um, I, I, I described it as that I, I fell in love with raving all over again, like because it helped uh, because not being able to party, we would come together as a community and have intentional gatherings and do and do this um, for a couple of years. Like really, I, I I remember during it, I remember thinking like, man, people are gonna really appreciate this fucking shit more now after this, and I really think that's true. I think that we, I think that most of us do. I I know I sure do, and so that's part of why I when I was trying to think about. Like, I was trying to just cognize and, you know, um, systematize thinking about what is it. And because um, we all have spiritual experiences on the dance floor, and, you know, and I, I think that society doesn't, and, and we know that that's the case, um, but I think society doesn't ha isn't familiar with any sort of framework in which to understand that or make sense of that. Because um, they know religion is you go to, uh, uh, you know, church, and you sit in the pews, and then they give you a fucking piece of bread, and then you <laughs> you go and then you give them twenty bucks and for the little teeny piece of bread, and you go home thinking that that was spirituality or whatever. So I think that's people think that that's what that's that's all you know, and well, and still the majority of the global population, like you said, flip a coin, it's probably Christian, Jewish, or Islamic. Like most of the half of the world still believes these these ridiculously dead, obsolete uh, religious traditions, or, I mean, it belongs to them. Um, but anyway, so, um, let's see, hold on, I only wanted to spend two minutes on each slide, but, hold on. Um, so, in a lot of, um, like, pagan cultures, so I, I, I use the word pagan to describe um, it's like it's an umbrella term for all of the you know mystical traditions that are found around the world because it was it was just a it was the, a term by, used by the Romans in the early Catholic Church where pagan just meant everybody who's just like not part of our club yet or, or like or by club it meant like colonized empire <laughs> and like so and so the past like literally so the conquest and genocide of the of North America was just you know. It took them a thousand years to get over here, but once they got over here, they did the same thing that they had been doing to Europe. They started in Europe and they, they you, know, you know, massacred the pagan priestesses and shamans. And so part of why Western civilization is the way that it is, is because of that project, because there was a, an edict by, it's called the Edict of Thessalonica in um, 380 AD, um, which uh, uh, officially endorsed um, the uh, replication of divine punishment on the peoples of the world who would re who would refuse to accept the you know the uh, orthodox uh, uh, doctrines of the early Catholic Church, and so that's what criminalized paganism. That's that's when the drug war started. That's when uh, officially, I, I I think yeah that that's when. I mean, the Roman Empire was fascistic, but the, the, that 
specific, hey, burn these heretics and pagans wherever you find them. Go everywhere in the world and burn them. And they did that, and they're still doing that. That's, we still have like 500,000 people in prison in America on drug charges. So it's still going on. Like, they, I, like I phrased it in the book, like they didn't have the technology to warehouse a, a million heretics back then, so they just burned us at the stake. But now, they built these, you know, vast prison system that, that has, you know, financial incentives, both not only in the private prison uh, uh, system, but in the public prison system too, because they, set, they build prisons in small towns, and so they become sources of economic activity and a jobs program for uneducated men to become prison guards and police. And so that's, it, so it's a, it, there's, so they create these incentives in the system to, you know, you know, even if the, all of those, uh, you know, uh, narcotics officers, even if they aren't all, you know, um, followers of the, the Edict of Thessalonica that says burn these fucking pagans, they're doing it anyways because they have, they have a, because capitalism has built on the incentive structure to do that, that Christianity set up. And so that's why we're in that system. And that's why those, fi those Johns Hopkins findings that started this, the, the psychedelic renaissance were so important because, it, because they explained to, or they, they I mean, not, not that fundamentalist Christians are particularly uh, persuaded by scientific evidence in general, <laughs> but for, what the, for whatever the truth is worth, at least we have a lot more evidence, you know, we're building the evidence, evidence base that would have been you know, they, they, the psychedelic research was, was, was really becoming an important um, uh, part of the psychiatric establishment in the 60s before, you know, uh, uh, people started saying, oh, cool, I, I woke up spiritually. Can we shut this fucking war down? And they're like, oh, wait, actually, wait, 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 hold on. We got to shut down this, uh, this spiritual awakening. So, so the, for the past 50 years, so for that 50 year period, like, who know, just, just think of the scientific advancement that has happened in all of the rest of science, but but the but like the science in, in this area has been, you know, stunted. But, um, but anyway, so like, so I, I I I draw a connection between you know modern drug dealers and um, ancient shaman because they're performing a very very functionally uh, similar service to society and they're they are persecuted in this society the way shamans were per and shamanists were persecuted in every society that rome discovered um, um so it's, and it's also important um so when, when, you, when you research rave culture in, in an academic sense i've one thing i've noticed is that there's a big um a split between um, the people who talk about drugs and the people who talk about music. There's a lot of people who um, just talk about, you know, you know, talk about rave culture in a way where it's, it's all about the music, it's all about the music. And it's like, yeah, 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 but also no. Because I, I, I believe strongly that um, the drugs are an important part of it. Like back going back to the early days of religion, like the, the spiritual impulse, we became human beings by tripping balls, and that's why we. That's that's why spirit, the spirituality is so deep in our deep in our uh, cognitive infrastructure because we became these sentient entities through these mystical experiences and grappling with, wow, that was wild. What does that mean? And then so and that that conundrum and per, uh, that perplexion of like trying to understand what you just experienced after a psychedelic experience is the thing that builds your consciousness into like they call it expanding consciousness you become more and more conscious by the very act of trying to understand what you just experienced and obviously we you know science you know we none of us understand it uh like much at all like no matter how many times hundreds of times we trip like we can st or study scientifically, like it, we're, it's still beyond our capacity to understand it. But like, but like Baba Brinkman said, like science can find the answers, and, and the answers are non-obvious. Like it, it's it's a, it, that, that's what the David Chalmers, the philosopher, he calls uh, the problem of he calls, he calls the question of consciousness the, the hard problem. Like it is the the most uh, difficult 
uh, question in all of uh, scientific inquiry, to understand what consciousness is. And I think that we will not be able to understand what it is without scientifically rigoring, rigorously reintegrating um, psychedelics into the, uh, the mainstream psychi psychiatry. Uh, it, it, it just has to be like, and psychology, it has to be fundamental to our understanding of it because, and, that, and that's why people in the, in the rave scene, in the festival scene, are just j always, or not, I shouldn't say always, but generally so much more conscious than normal people because we have, we, because we have had these difficult mystical experiences that we, that we, that we have struggled to integrate into our ordinary consciousness. And so we, that struggle of integration is like part of the thing that causes us to become more conscious. And music is one of the things that, like, music was developed in the early, you know, you know, far, far, far before civilization, because you know we would be, you know, just like tripping and dancing wildly around a fire and banging on logs and like hollering gibberish and like making sounds and noises and rhythms, and so we became, you know, um, that, because that accentuated the experience and it kind of went with it. And so, like, that's why you know, dancing on a dance floor, it, that's why it feels so primal and it feels so core to what we are, because it was core to the early stages of us becoming what we are. Um, and so yeah, that's where the, the that's why it's so funny that, um, that, uh, that, so, that the word ecstasy is like, has become so demonized, it's like a dirty word. I even like, I, I, I uh, even I don't often say it. I even, even I abbreviate it, abbreviate it E as like in terms of when you're talking about the drug, but like even just the, the word ecstasy feels so, Naughty, partially because I, <laughs> right? But like, partially because I got caught up for selling it in, in college, and <laughs> and, uh, and I got and I got um when I when the dean of my university was like kicked me out or like I I I, I, I really say it and got I mean, still got got back in and got back and applied, but the the dean of the university said said that um, he had to expel me because I was contributing to an epidemic of ecstasy on campus, and. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'll never forget how fucking funny that sounded to me in that moment. Like, like yeah, an epi that's a real epidemic right there, dude. Like, Right, well, I mean, I was really good, but there's probably, it was probably just getting, I mean, it was probably, I, it was just, it was popular, I mean, but because it's, it's unambiguously positive, it's the one thing that, like, I mean, a lot of people have difficult experiences on most, you know, psychedelics, just because it's, there's, they are so, they're not straightforward, they're like, um, it's like how, you know, um, um, Andreas Thompson talks about like uppers and downers and all arounders, and so it is an all arounder, but it is still, but it has an orient a general orientation more so than the other all arounders. <laughs> but um, but it's the fun like it's the fundamental psychological phenomenon at the core of the phenomenology of religion, the, the religious, the primary religious experience or the mystical experience, the, the core of spirituality, um, and so. That I think that I, I, I just want to include that slide because I think it's important that we make some, you know, push to renormal, you know, renormalize that term and make it make it so that people can understand this is a positive phenomenon, positive experience. Like, um, and, and 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 in making that argument, if you ever find yourself making that point to someone, point out that the um, uh, negative things that ever ha that almost all the negative things that ever happen with people doing quote unquote ecstasy is from there being adulterants in it, which are the result of pro pro prohibition. So that's a really, really, really important point to always make in any conversation about this, that the danger comes from the prohibition because, <laughs> because there's, the, there's no regulations. Um, and yeah, so I, I, I think it's, uh, I think pe people don't think of like, the dance floor. I mean, a lot of people in this community do, I think, but um, I think a lot of people just don't understand how how spiritual the dance floor is, like, um, because we we get lost in the vibe. Like, it's it's what it's like designed to. Um, like, I, I read in somewhere um, that it's um, that good dance floors are energy enhancement environments. So it's like the the whole entire thing is or the decor and the lighting and the music and the 
and the performance and the dancers and the people's outfits and the, all of the things are of this big, you know, system of, of uh, potentiators to the, this, the, the mystical experience that can be had by, because you, you, you can get yourself into a trance even with, even with no drugs, that's, that's, that's definitely very possible. You can have an ecstatic dancing experience. Like, there's a whole ecstatic dance community that mostly is sober while they're dancing and they, they like literally get into trance state just from flow dancing. Like, and so the, the dance itself is, is also the, a spiritual ritual. And so I have this also this, like this theory that, and make this argument in the book that, um, like I had, I had re- rewatched the movie Footloose, and when I was researching the book about this like small town like band dancing, and like then I was researching it and like that's that's true. There's, like there are still small towns in America that have bands on dancing like that, like that that's it's not a it's not we're not past that. We're, like and, and it goes back to the Salem witch trials actually, because uh, Inc- there's a guy's name Increase Mather who he was like he was the second president of Harvard University in the 1600s, and so he. He was the head of the clergy in Boston, and he um, wrote that he wrote this hilarious tract called um, "An Arrow Against uh, Profane and Obscene and Obscene Dancing," and he argues that like that like you know good good pious Christians would never dance because you know that's only for heathens and blah blah, and so he like so that's and so part so I think a lot of the the, the Salem witch trials that like I think a lot of that was like. People were just like literally fucking dancing and like they're like yeah, she's a witch like and so <laughs> and so like the, and the, the witch trials were like had been going on for hundreds of years um, and I, I and I really think that it like back that other one with the fire like the like and, and when, you, when you watch movies about witches they always show them dancing around a fire and hollering like in a wild ecstatic trance states like and so you can imagine how to these like prudish purit- puritan clergymen, uh, you know, while they're trying to set up a colonial empire in a pagan continent, <laughs> be like, yeah, we need to, you know, get real strict about this and not let any of a, um, anyways. <laughs> and also, liturgies, all, all, all religions have liturgy, like, they all have, you know, their priests that, who, you know, give their sermons, and, and it's all pageantry and ritual theater. Like, I remember being a kid, and, like, Especially like the Catholic Church has a lot of pageantry. Like they they wear those fucking big crazy hats and like all the you know, the robes and the things that hanging over. Like it's all theater and it's all just to it's all just a show. And people, it's like it's just so funny to me because like people go there and they tithe, you know, give their fucking put their twenty in the basket and like they think they're paying to for a for a relationship with God, but they're just paying for a show. They're just paying for the priest to read Bible passages to them and then give them a fucking sip of wine and. Call it a day, and, um, and hope that they don't, you know, try to, you know, look any further than that. But <laughs> right, <laughs> totally. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, and so, and and it, and some ritual theaters are, you know, more authentically um, divine than others, and divinity is a social contract. But it, it, like, you should all definitely see. The rights of rights of which ritual th- ritual theater. I forget exactly what time over at Beacon. Do not miss that. The rights of r- ritual theater. An offering to Ma, Ma-, Ma- uh, at Beacon. Uh, it might be tomorrow night. I'm guessing. Is it tonight? Oh, it's tonight. Okay. Thank you for correcting me on that. Yeah. So tonight at 10:30. Thank. Okay. Tonight at 10:30 at the Beacon. Do not miss it. Rights of ritual theater. So um, that's what. That's the best. You know iteration of this concept that I've ever seen. Um, Isis Andrea, who, who the, the, you know, the choreo, you know, uh, head witch, like, yeah, she's, she's a genius visionary, so do not miss her play over there. And uh, I won't go into this too much because I talked about it a bunch last year, but the Elysian Mysteries were like, in ancient Greece, you know, a ritual theater um, experience, psychedelic ritual theater experience that was like the backbone of um, ancient Greek civilization, and it's why they had such a such a robust uh, uh, pantheon, like a robust uh, mythological system, and all these, I don't know if, you, I, I highly recommend studying Greek myth, it's really, really, really fascinating, and there's a reason that Freud um, named all of the um, uh, uh, 
different uh, so psychological pathologies that human beings can experience. They named them all after Greek myth characters because the system of Greek mythology was so profoundly um, um, expressive of different aspects of the human psyche. Um, and so, and that's why a mon like monotheistic uh, theological traditions are so impoverished on a philosophical and mythological and spiritual level because um, to only have one God that is that happens to be you know this, this authoritarian you know bearded white man you know throwing lightning bolts and like people, people who worship Yahweh seem to not understand that Yahweh's whole fucking shtick was just a rip off of Zeus like it wasn't even like but anyways but they don't believe in Zeus though so but anyways and so. The El City Mysteries got shut down by you know the Catholics, and I I I, I made them made them uh, uh, look like Klansmen to 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 kind of show that it's the same thing happening when the early church you know when it started going around and they, they shut down the, the temple at Eleusis and massacred the priestesses and like they they did ex the same thing that you know the the clan is doing here you know they might not like. Like, like many rappers have said, they turned in their white hoods for blue uniforms, you know. Oh yeah, and the, yeah. So and, then that, and that's why um, there's a rise in you know people uh, uh, identifying as witches and practicing witchcraft um, because it's like it's the reemergence of this you know um, mystical tradition that's been you know under the boot of Christian theocracy for two thousand years and. Uh, so yeah, and so there's like a there's a dual thing happening between like oh I only have 15 minutes left, 10 minutes left. Okay, all right. <laughs> I'd asked for two hours this year, but okay, right. Oh oh oh, nice. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so this concept of rebirth is really important because um, both I think this whole emergence of uh, neo paganism in the, the form of the Sarai culture. Um, it is both a rebirth of the mystical tradition and also a rebirth, you know, also is facilitating individual rebirths. Like, um, like there's this phenomenon in, in Christianity that I've always found very strange where they, people call themselves born again Christians. And it's so strange because it's like, I, I just, I really don't, I really highly doubt that they had a mystical experience as part of that rebirth. I think it was like they got, went to jail, or they got too heavily addicted to drugs, or they, or, you know, bad drugs, and, and like, or there, there was something that got fucked up in their life, and they're, like, desperate, and they're, like, all right, I'm just, let me, maybe Christianity will work, and so they will, are, like, reborn as a Christian, and I just, I think that that's, uh, I mean, honestly, I frankly, I think those, those, uh, people are, I don't, I don't know. A little bit insane, but I, I uh, the, there's, there's also a saying that says uh, no, no one's more zealous than a convert. Um, so like people who are raised in religions, kind of it's just in the background of their uh, mental life, and so people who like d discover a spiritual identity are more enthusiastic about it. And that's what the, the, the evangelicalism is the you know the, the drive to to spread the good news of your own spiritual enlightenment, and so. Um, so I would always call myself an evangelical raver because I really, I'm like really, I want to spread this whole thing. Like that's why that's why I sold back in the day. So I really want, I was spreading the good news as I saw it, um, and so that's why I I like uh, salute and uh, uh, thank and respect anybody who's um, risking their risking their civil rights to continue to practice shamanism in the society. Uh, they, mad, mad, right? Yeah. Thank, to anyone out there. Who might be in that position? Thank you for what you do. <laughs> um, but so the I, the phenomenon in of rebirth in the rave scene is, uh, and, just the, and I know a lot of people don't like, I, I, but I'm I'm reclaiming that word. If you don't like calling, thinking of yourself as a raver, then uh, whatever. But I think you should get over it. But <laughs> but. The idea of rave names, like when I, when, I, when I went to my first rave, I remember I'm meeting all these people with all these weird names and I just remember thinking it was so cool. I was like, I want a cool name. And so, <laughs> so I was like, it, it took me a month or two to like, of searching you know, to, you know, for, for a, a name to come up. And so that's why the name Neon is so important to me because it, it, it really was a, you know, the, it, was, it was the 
it was the timid, bullied uh, guy who tried to be cool, tried to, you know, wished that he was cool, but knew that he was an uh, outcast or whatever. Like that, that character that I was always like, you know, dissatisfied with gr growing up was like, you know, uh, if I had a metamorphosis and, be, you know, grew into a, you know, you know a being with, you know, confidence and, uh, uh, uniqueness and whatever, and I, I think that I think that's what raving does for people. I I think that, like I think that it's one of its key functions, and right, exactly, yep, exactly, um, manifesting our um, you know true selves that outside of the what we were you know uh, the boxes we were put in. Um, and also the the concept of rite of passage is really important too because so there's this phenomenon of uh, uh, ontogenetic or ontogenic crippling and so it's like what, most of the the uh, the uh, how it seems like our civilization is like it's had its maturity stunted and it seems like you know uh, when you see the popularity of like you know men's rights activists or like all these people who like have the grown men who like have the the sense of humor of a 12 year old like it's because it's because they never had a rite of passage you know where they fully spiritually became into their selves like they they they, they were they were their their spiritual growth was stunted by the their by their uh, their lack of a rite of passage into um, adulthood like they they just never experienced that and so i think most people you know they, they, there's we got people walking around and you know with gray hair in a suit and they're they're with the spiritual you know maturity of a teenager because they just they didn't go through what you know for the vast majority of human history before 2000 years ago was normal people in the tribe went th went through rites of passage and that's how they became you know inducted into the, that's how they that's how they were able to uh, self-conceptualize themselves as a part of a tribe rather than an individual that's somehow ontologically separate from everything and some and, and which therefore then gives them the right to dominate anyone and everyone or anyone and everything that they can you know get their hands on or their boots on I guess yeah and, th and that's why our society is falling apart uh, <laughs> I don't know if anybody's noticed but <laughs> Uh, there's a little bit of dis social disintegration going on, and and uh, and it was like, and I and I think that this the this you know rebirth of shamanism really the, the mystical you know um, you know the reintegration of mystical experiences into ordinary life um, is is key to um, having a coherent s society. Like you know, I, I don't know if you ever find yourself. Quoting George Costanza when people do some dumb selfish shit. Like, we live in a, you know, we live in a society. Like, like most people don't know that. People don't like. Uh, Margaret Thatcher said, "There's no such thing as society. There are only individuals acting in their own self-interest." Like that was, that was the dominant hegemonic paradigm of understanding of reality. She said, "There is no such thing as society," and that's how basically our government is operating now. Ever since basically the 70s, when they shut down the psychedelic. Movement. They, I, they, they were like, okay, we gotta, we gotta really push this, this, this uh, individualism thing because if people start, you know, thinking of themselves as a, you know, co coherent community, like a global community, if people start, if in, uh, everyday citizens start identifying with, you know, peasants and other continents, then it, they're not gonna support their, co their government, like, you know, spending a trillion dollars to bomb and take all their stuff, like, so, um, anyways. And the pilgrimage feature is another like thing that's common to you know um, all most most religions. There's a and uh, so there's a phenomenon of like how, how long it takes to get here, you know, and how long you gotta fucking sit in line and burn, get Burning Man. You gotta sit in your car for ten fucking hours in the dust, and not going anywhere. And then by the time you get there, it's like oh whoa, I am in a whole another dimension or whatever. Like the the pilgrimage to the holy site is is a is an important thing. <laughs> <laughs> and like so that's why it's so mi so magical when you go to an underground rave in the middle of nowhere where they don't publicize the location until the last minute. You got to call an info line and then you got to.
stop at a checkpoint and ask a guy. But we're, and like, once you get to the party, once you finally find the party, it's like, it makes the party so special because you had to get, make a big journey to get there. And I, I think that that's why, you know, at Eleusis, they, you know, people would walk ten, you know, m miles and miles, like 100 miles from all over the entire Greek-speaking world, they would make pilgrimages to Eleusis. And I think that a lot of, you know, spiritual traditions have that. And, um, and also holidays. Hol holidays are also very uh, important to every single religious tradition um, because there are uh, um, dates where the whole community can like be on the same, you know, get on the same page spiritually and like about and we're, cause, because we're all, if we're all, you know, getting on the same vibe with regard to whatever, um, y usually seasonally based, like most most holidays are. You know, organized around the seasons, like whether they're, whether they're these holidays, like LIP. LA, LIP is my biggest holiday every year. This is my, my favorite thing that happens every single year. It's the most important holiday of my uh, world. Um, and so, and it's you know, it's it's always like it marks the beginning of the summer, like festive seasons, like you know, t taking off. Like it's a big like, all right, we're out of the cold, and you know, it's like we're it's like summer party time. Like it's just, and it's a. But yeah, and there's and there's um, you know there's ones that are annual, there's ones that are weekly. There's like, like there's a lot of you know like there's in San Francisco there's an event called Stamina. It's like a drum free drum bass weekly every Sunday night like at, at F8 like there's free drum bass and it's like always good. And it's just and I, every and every time I go there I see a lot of the same people. So it's just like this. It's very much like church. We have this like you know we we, we gather there and it's a regular thing where we all our our spiritual community all gets to see each other and participate in this communion ritual to dancing to drum bass together on Sunday nights. And it's just like, there's there's lots of things. There's monthly events that, you know, it's how you build a community is around these regular events. And so I have so much respect for people who throw those events because it's such thankless work. They put so much time and effort into it and barely make any money. And it's uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really uh, righteous work people put on events. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Oh, yeah, and the other thing I want to say about that is that, like, one thing that's different about um, psychedelic holidays as opposed to, you know, stale, dogmatic Christian holidays is that ours are evolutionary in the sense that we're iterating. And every single year, like, anybody who throws a party regularly, like, each time they throw that party, it gets a little bit better. Like, because they learn from the last time, and the thing just grows and grows in quality. And, and because, because of that consciousness thing, so that we're in this, like, this like evolution, like spiral upwards of we're evolving our ability to have these, you know, spiritually productive events. And so, whereas like if you go to church, they'll read that same fucking passage to you for the whole rest of your life. It's the same shit, does not change. You're not learning anything from that. You still got to pay your twenty bucks though. And um, the other thing that's great about this this uh, culture is that because of the um, um, non-dogmatic and you know um, global global nature of it, it we're able to bring in elements from spiritual traditions from around the world and throughout history. We're able to like integrate any and use any any like little you know every any little symbol or like aesthetic flair or any little you know thing like people just I I love that about it because it's like. Because we're all, all religions are basically telling the same story, but in just a little bit different and, and tweaked in a way to, you know, benefit whomever in some cases, you know, sometimes it's to benefit the tiny elite and sometimes people genuinely are trying to benefit, the, you know, the mass of people. But uh, we can pick and choose things from wherever and, just, and, and keep them if they're good for us and, you know, dispose of them if they're not. And we're not, we don't have to be attached to any, any individual. Um, iconography or anything like that and uh, yeah thank you um, and so back and that, that kind of goes back to um, back in the early days of before civilization when you know we were all just making it up all along making it up as we went we were making up language we were inventing um, ways of being together and like inventing like uh, inventing ways of managing society because we because we didn't have um, we didn't have any of the structures of, there was no government there was no family units there was no 
um, like the, one, of, one of the most important books I've ever written uh, that everyone should read is called um, uh, it's called uh, uh, the the invention of uh, uh, the, the invention of the family, private property, and the state um, uh, uh, by Frederick Engels, where he talks about how like the government and the nuclear family and private property all came into existence around the same time right when we invented agriculture because all of a sudden we had we were able to grow we were, we were able to produce a surplus of food and then somebody was like hey that's i'm gonna take control of that shit but because before that for the first you know i i think of because you know there's different different uh different ways that people um track it but i i i generally think of like religion as having been invented basically about 50,000 years ago or around when the language was invented and we don't have a hard date on that because there's not a, like hard you know it's not very very difficult to piece together you know pre what pre happened in prehistory because there's no record of it because de by definition um but from what i've learned so that basically that 40,000 years we were we were inventing society before we invented civilization and those those inventions um were you know eclectic because they were you know um being uh, created out of whole cloth right. and uh so yeah that 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 one thing that i think is um that the, one of the like the main function that uh of a, a a primary at least function of religion that uh religious people kind of um uh, tend to lord over us. Well, that's an interesting use of that phrase. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, is the fact that um, it's the crisis of meaninglessness. They say that without God, there's no meaning in our lives. And so I, uh, I'm an existentialist, in which existentialism is the belief that um, there is no inherent meaning in reality. Our, we have to all meaning that we have is meaning that we add to it. So go. It's a conscious. It's just a phenomenon of subject of consciousness that we make the meaning, and so to the extent to which, you know, we have um, um, a society of, full of, you know, people who are are uh, adrift and have no fucking meaning in their lives, and we got a suicide crisis and a, you know, a, you know, a sedative addiction crisis, it's because people don't have sufficient meaning in their like they haven't been able to find meaning in their lives, partially because of the way that capitalism works. Like they have manufactured our reality so that we will feel their, the need to purchase things that we don't need in order to find meaning that way. They, they need us to have meaningless lives other outside of our engagement with the consumer economy. And so that's why it's so, um, that's why like, you know, the, you know uh, trend forecasters and stuff like talk about how um, one of the things that's happening with uh, the current generations is that people are less focused on um, spending their money on goods and they spend their money on experiences more often. So like that's there's this shift away from because you know consumerism is so hollow that like we, uh, hundred years of it already. It's like it's real apparent to almost everyone that you know that you can't become happy by buying things, but. People don't know how uh, any other uh, uh, idea of how to become happy because the society is like there's only this one way you gotta buy this this and this and this. But so I think the dance floor is a. I went one time on the dance floor. I, I was I was on K and I had I always keep it I always keep a note with no, notebook with me on the dance floor because I have a lot of real good um, epiphanies on the dance floor, especially in K. Um, and I write I was like I oh, gotta write this shit down right away. <laughs> And so I had this, uh, this, this, uh, this epiphany that the dance floor itself is a meaning-making mechanism. So that we're, when we go engage on the dance floor and we, when we dance together in community in, in, in a way, in a, in a, with mystical technologies, we, we can make meaning in our lives that, in a way that like, is, is uh, socially beneficial. We can like, you know, and, and also intellectually um, stimulating. So we can like, you know, learn from each other and learn how to love each other and like learn how to love e ourselves, most importantly, because you can't love anyone if you don't love yourself. So, um, and we, it, we learn that on the dance floors that we create, the types of dance floors like exist at this festival. And uh, so yeah, the, um, 
the word revelation is really important in religion, um, and so there's a, there's the distinction between um, experiential revelation and uh, scriptural or liter literary revelation. Like, so they 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 they, uh, they like Christians call the Bible the revealed truth of God, and uh, by revealed they re they're referring to like some guy thousands of years ago talked to God and wrote it down, and then so we're supposed to take his word for it rather than like talking to God ourselves or whatever. So um, so uh, there are one thing that we can, you know, do in this culture is, you know, we can actually cut out that middleman. And that's part of what, that's part of what that spiritual but not religious phenomenon is, uh, is uh, talking to or, uh, you know, coming from, is that we're, we are abandoning the, you know, the scriptural, you know, secondhand, you know, handing down of, you know, uh, what, some prophets who might have, you know, smoked a burning bush or something and <laughs> wrote down some rules. God said you got to do this and that or whatever. <laughs> and people still want to put it in the schools today. There's, the Republicans are still passing laws right now to be, be able to put the Ten Commandments in public schools all over the country. And uh, it's, it's insane. That I, I, I honestly, I thought that, I didn't think that that, I thought we were going in the other direction, but it's, it's kind of, a little troubling that, that, that they're passing. But I think that's part of why I think they're, they do, they're doing that because they know that they're losing this, this culture war. They, they know they, they have, they're doing everything they can to get their, uh, you know, fascist dogmas into our public spaces because they, they know that they have to force their way in. Otherwise, we won't let them in because it's illogical and immoral. So. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, and I alluded to this earlier about the sacraments, like the, the idea of the, the Eucharist and being just a, you know, little piece of unleavened bread and, and uh, some just like basic wine. Like wine in, in the ancient Greek world was like actually like rotten and psychedelic. So they like, so it was a different type of wine that they prescribed in the early uh, scriptures, but they don't, they don't, uh, they cut those ones out when they codified the Bible in the Council of Nicaea in 325. Um, but anyway, so the naturalistic religion, the word naturalistic and like nat naturalism is the belief in uh, that, the, that the laws of physics uh, totally describe reality. That, that there's not like, there's not an entity outside of the laws of physics that can break the laws of physics and, you know, in, you know manipulate goings on on Earth. Like, naturalism is just a, you know, it's a philosophical belief, you know, that, you know, that's not happening, that the, everything can be explained by uh, empiricism. And so that's why I, I love the, the idea of like naturalistic sacraments because like psychedelics are things where you know it's like it's a it's a piece of nature that we've figured out like tweaks our brain in a way that makes us have these experiences, and so it's it's a naturalistic sort of uh, and get you know thing where we don't have to like be like it's not fiat. You know, yeah, all the crypto bros talk about talk about fiat currency as if as if their, their cryptos aren't also fiat, but like so fiat just means it only. Ex exists because of peace, people's belief in it. And so the, the Eucharist is only a holy sacrament because it's a fiat holy sacrament. I, I had not thought about that before. That's a good one. All right, I don't have a, if, so if I weren't recording this, I would write that down right now. Um, but yeah, and I talked about that uh, energy enhancement environments thing. So, so desubjectification de is that, that ex mystical experience of transcendence of like, like you, you are, so you lose your, your sense of self. Like people talk about ego death and like where you're, you're, you are at one, and it's also so cliche, but you're at one with the universe. And, and uh, so the, all of the aspects of the dance floor, I guess, yeah, I, I covered that. Yeah, it's all consciousness technologies, both the drugs and the lights and the, and the music and, and the walls and the whatever. And, um, and that's why it's uh, has such theor such um, uh, promising and uh, efficacious therapeutic contexts too. Like that's part of what um, what Mitchell was talking about at the end of his talk. If you guys caught part of that, he he was talking about how um, how problematic it it will be if we restrict access to psychedelics to a trained medical a, a, a administration by trained medical professionals. Like that will be it will be better than nothing, but it will it will. Um, be a drop in the bucket of what could be uh, of the um, of the work that psychedelics could do for the mental health uh, crisis in this world, um, because 
the people have you know ecstatic therapy on the dance floor all the time. Like people when people take psychedelics in, in a completely unregulated context where you know there's they don't have a they don't have a guide. They don't have a you know a lot of people don't even have a friend to be with them on their first trip and they just trip you know by, you know with their friends. They're, they're all amateurs. Like I remember my first time tripping. Like we were all like we didn't know what the fuck we were doing. Fifteen like none of us ever tried it before. Like and it was you know like positively altered the court the trajectory of, tra trajectory of my life more than almost anything else and so you don't and so that's why he, when he was saying that that one of those options on that spectrum of legalization uh uh frameworks is of the over-the-counter with no age requirements i am an advocate of that far end of the extreme of the legalization um uh, paradigm because i i just i don't think that like i think parents should you know maybe study the science and recommend people don't do certain things at certain things. But like, I, I think that it should all be available to whomever. And, I, and we should at least, or, or we should at least more rigorously study what ages below which it could actually be problematic for people to have certain experiences. Like we just don't have any data around that. And uh, so, and, and in the completely un unregulated back black market, that's basically, there was no, there's a, you don't have to show, as a, this one uh, dude in um, law enforcement against prohibition, um, uh, said, um, uh, he said, uh, uh, drug dealers don't ask for ID. So he's like, they're already in that paradigm, we're already in the paradigm where people as young as whatever can get whatever. Like, so, um, anyways. Um, yeah, and that, I think I talked about it too, the, that we like, you know, learn that we're just a thread in the fabric of society. Um, and yeah, so I read somewhere that that um, raving is like praxis, like it's putting into practice the theoretical um, musings of the philosophical and theological traditions from the past 5,000 years of history that we have recorded. Like if people have been writing about the most profound aspects of you know what humans can be and experience and you know uh, grow into and evolve into, but like. It's, it's all like, people call armchair philosophy. Like honestly, most philosophy is armchair philosophy. But like, raving is like actually fucking doing it philosophy. Like it's like you're actually like because philosophy is just the love of wisdom. And so if you can get like if you can like those epiphanies that I'm talking about. Like we, like I'm a writer, so I happen to write mine down. But I know everyone has profound philosophical revelations on the desk floor. I know that's that's a that's a very common thing, and I think that that's the like whole point of this whole shit. <laughs> oh yeah, that's, the, that's what I meant by cultural fertility. Like the word, like the the. That's why so. That's why there's so many weirdos in this culture because it's like people are culturally innovating beyond what they. Because most people don't wear weird clothes or call themselves weird names or do weird things because they're afraid of being looked at as weird frankly, because they haven't, you know, experienced the weirdness of the psychedelic experience, really. So they don't know how that could be a good thing, actually, uh, especially in, uh, in the backdrop of a, um, oppressive, uh, uh, normative, uh, planned, whatever. And then part of this is like that we're moving into a cybernetic paradigm, which, you know, is, has been going on for a long time, but it's like, uh, it's becoming, it's like um, many people talk about, it's on an asymptotic, you know, acceleration towards uh, um, towards the time where, you know, like, so the digital technologies, I, I don't know if everyone knows, but they were invented by people who ha had psychedelic visions, and they're like, oh yeah, we could probably create these machines where you could, where you could like, where you could uh, turn on your speaker from the other side of the room, like, without even uh, there being a cord there, like, that's some psychedelic shit, and so... <laughs> So like wh the idea of this, and I, and I know there's a lot of a lot of people in in this community don't aren't as gung ho about this, uh, uh, you know, wiring our brains into the fucking cyberspace thing as I am. But I think that that is the next uh, step that I almost I almost didn't include in this because it's a whole other talk, but which I will probably give here at some point. Yeah. But. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's just it, it, that's just a part of. What all this is like, we're designing reality. Like, real, like, the, like there's a great book on uh, on video games called The World Is Broken, or no, real, no, it's called The Reality Is Broken. But uh, um, Jane McGonigal, I think is her name. Um, 
but where she talks about how like yeah just our whole fucking reality is dysfunctioning and that's part of why we have so many problems is because like the game of civilization has been is is so old that it's and it, that it's an obsolete that it's just it's not functioning with what we how we need it to function that's part of why with you know 200 species are very um they are dying because we're like our our civilization is like is is, uh, is is breaking down and and i think that spaces like this help oh, oh thank you <laughs> um spaces like this um they they teach us that we don't have to accept reality as it is presented to us like we can um like we can we can evolve it we can we can participate in the conscious evolution of reality uh, and i think we learn that in places like this because we see things so we see people doing things that we didn't know were possible like it turns out this one great one great line where he's like to um to like to, to sing dance uh uh i said a bunch of other like cool verbs like things that have never uh it never it never existed oh, damn i wasn't planning on saying that close i can really butcher it but I mean, I've heard it in like a few like sideways songs and, and also in a lecture, but um, anyways, like it's, we're, we're learning how to do things that, that nobody's ever done. And then, and that's how, that's the core mechanism of evolution is random mutations. Like evolution is a, is a reciprocal feedback loop between random mutations, like imperfect replication of what already exists, imperfect replication. And that imperfection leads to random mutations and, the, and then the environment selects which of those random mutations will continue and be re replicated going into the future and so that's why this all this stuff like we're all we see you know we see somebody like i remember at my first rave i saw somebody with their cores and i was like those are dope and then i've been wearing i got now i got like every color and i wear them with every, every outfit and there's like i didn't have this idea to like take some the lenses out of my glasses like i learned it from somebody at a rave and so it's just stuff like that like we're all learning things you know weird cool things from each other constantly and that's part of how we're, we're accelerating each other's evolution and designing our you know reality in the process oh yeah and um i also learned this word recently in a book i was reading um utopia it's because you know utopian philosopher and uh i love that because you know Mar marx talked about religion is the opiate of the masses and so the, that, it fun that most religion especially what had ex the, existed in, in the 1800s but that's basically still what's here now in a lot, in a lot, in a lot of ways, like it does put people to sleep, and but but these, but this this religion, this uh, revitalized and you know re psychedelicized <laughs> re, uh, religion, like it can be a utopia where we actually it it actually helps incentivize people to change reality because um, we see what's possible and what's fucked up, and that's how we create the. Um, heaven on earth that's like the 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 prophesied end goal of um you know like follow these rules that god said so and will you'll get rewarded with heaven afterwards and um so i'm a very big believer that like 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 i started to get into at the end the very end of the crunch time of my talk last year but the, like jesus was not talking about 2000 years from his life he was talking about right now but then like he was saying all of this has to change we need we're gonna have a new fucking thing right here right now and like that's where he got killed for that um and a lot of people are uh, you know suffering uh, uh fates from the you know, pe pe there's people there's still there's people who've been in prison for 30 years serving life sentences for selling acid they're, they're still in prison right now they're, those are political prisoners those are pr prisoners in a those are of a, of a war those are like those are uh those are people who are victims of a holy war that's being fought against us and uh they must be released like um as the drug war you know breaks down and comes to an end like every one of those political prisoners has to be released immediately and yeah so this is my last slide just that the uh, i wanted to uh, make to um remind everybody of plur uh because i uh I don't hear it enough, and I feel like it's the it's the most uh, like peace, love, unity, and respect are the like the core of this whole thing. It's what we learn here, and what we learn at raves and being part of a rave community um, is to, you know, like I, I love each other universally and peacefully and respectfully, and I I just I think that that's 
the future of civilization. It's the only way that civilization could possibly be co become coherent enough to survive. There's too much, uh, the, the weapons are too big for the, the divisions that, like, like, like Baba said, ooh, like, to bring it back to the fucking poem at the beginning, if the holy wars don't kill us first, let's hope religion <laughs> evolves. <laughs> Time for anything? Okay, for sure. Damn, I did have one more slide that I didn't get to, but that ending just fucking sewed it up so, so good. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Q&A, yeah. That'd be a good, better use of the five minutes. Yeah, totally. Oh, yeah, so the, uh, the book that I've, I've been working on this fucking thing for a really long time, and it turned into a, a trilogy, and um, it's about the evolution of civilization. Um, via our reciprocal relationship with technology and ideas and how it, they evolve um, by feeding back upon each other and uh, and I think that and so it's br it's broken down into I, I realize I, the reason it turned into a trilogy is because I, once I started writing about psychedelics I realized that it, it was a more important factor in the story that I was telling than I had given it a space in, in the book when it was only a single volume um, because I think that like obviously, we all know technology is evolving at an incredibly rapidly accelerating rate, and almost to like to the extent that people are afraid of it. They're, like there's, there's, I can't go on Facebook now without people talking about how scared they are of technology. Like these people are like, people are saying that we shouldn't make art with AI, and as if like, as if like okay, as if. That should be some one thing that we remain in the you know what a previous obsolete paradigm on. But anyways, I'm, my point just being, um, not obsolete, but you know, what I mean. um, but I think that our we are only going to avoid annihilating ourselves as a, as a species, not even just as a civilization, but as a species, um, is by evolving ourselves mentally and I, I think psychedelics are are the tool to evolve us mentally in a way that we will be able to even conceptualize a different way of doing things let alone a better way like the, people just can't even think of a different way like people like pe people are so like you know, uh, Mark Fisher talked about capitalist realism how the, the main, main success of capitalism is that it, it has managed to make people incapable of imagining a different way the civilization could be organized and so that's that's I think that the why psychedelics are so important it's like it's maybe if not the most important technology that we have at our disposal because it enables us to break out of that uh, that that lack of imagination you the purpose of utopia is to is to break us out of the expectations and the boundaries of what we've been told to expect or imagine for as a possibility for humanity and civilization and so we and people have that's why people like when in the, that's why in the 60s everybody's like peace and love man let's shut this war down and like like that's a utopian like that's a radical radical position to take like civilization has has just been having war after war after war for thousands of years and so for people to be like, yeah, no, let's not, let's not do that. We're going to have a peace movement. We're going to get fucking millions of people in the streets. Like, because we figured out that we don't want to go kill people for this, you know, paradigm. Like, and it's like, who to thunk it? We, they, we, the people, nobody thought of that shit, like, for thousands of years. Or if they did, they were so in the minority that they just got sent to prison or assassinated. And so, but when, in the 60s, when, you know, LSD was just, it was just like, they, the American Franks just drove a bus across the country and, you know, just like dose the country, and all of a sudden America is like, yeah, no more war, dude. <laughs> like, and so I, I think that that's a, a really important factor. So that's 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 um, volume one, and I probably don't have much time to talk about the others, right? But the, should I wrap that up? All right. So well, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Love you too.